Yeah. Yeah. All right, so what's going to happen is I'm going to welcome everybody. Going, it's um, five past five, although that clock says it's five past four, it's not. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Um, looking around the room, I can see some friendly and familiar faces, but I certainly can see some people that I don't know. For the people who don't know me, um, I'm Charlotte Carrington Farmer. I'm an Associate Professor of History here at Roger Williams University. And it's my genuine delight to be able to bring together some of the most talented, bright, and knowledgeable people to come to talk to you this evening about a particular moment in the 17th century that took place around 400 years ago to, to this particular time of year. So this evening we're going to hear from um, two scholars who we're going to introduce um, in a second, and they're going to talk to us about a moment in the 17th century where um, the Massasoya Osamequin um, was, was very sick and Plymouth Edward Winslow made the journey to Soham's um, in this spirit of friendship and healing. Um, so I'm going to introduce one of our speakers and then I'm going to hand over to Dave Weed who's going to introduce himself and our second speaker. So to my immediate right is um, Richard Pickering who is the Deputy Executive Director of Plymouth Patuxent Museums. He is I think perhaps the most knowledgeable person on anything specific to Plymouth in the, seventh, the 1620s. Like, he knows so much, and I've had the privilege of working with Richard on several different projects. Um, some of you know right now I'm writing a journal article on Roger Williams' wife, Mary Williams. That wasn't my idea. That was Richard's idea three years ago for Women's History Month to talk, tell Mary's story. He asked me to do that, and I said yes, knowing really nothing about Mary. Um, and it really pushed me to write this journal article. So I'm really glad to call him a friend, a colleague, and someone who's really pushed my own scholarly endeavors. So Richard is gonna be one of our guest panelists tonight, and I can't wait to learn new things from him this evening, as I always do. Um, Dave, I'll hand over to you to introduce yourself, your project, and then also Don. Uh, I'm Dave Weed. Um, I spent uh, about 40 years working as a clinical psychologist, but uh, only uh, uh, the last five years ago when I retired, I discovered uh, something in my backyard. Uh, at Burrs Hill, how many people have been to Burrs Hill Park? All right, so you, you know that there's a monument there to Usamequin. I knew nothing about him. And then I started asking questions. One thing led to another. And here I am five years later working on uh, initiating a national heritage area that will recognize the story of what has taken place right here in Psalms. I hope you know you are in Psalms now. Mm -hmm. Bristol up to Providence and Rehoboth, Seekonk, and Swansea and Somerset are all the original homeland of the Massasoit. Uh, and we're gonna hear a little bit more about him and uh, get a better understanding in terms of uh, what took place in 1623 that changed history, basically. And uh, we'll have a chance to hear some different perspectives on that. But had that event turned out differently, uh, everything would have changed. So we need to know more and appreciate it. And especially at this occasion, this is the 400th anniversary of that event. You only get a few 400th anniversaries every now and then, so you don't want to miss it. But let me start with a land acknowledgement. We welcome the Poconoke people in, to the, in their ancestral home for the past 10,000 years. Okay? Uh, we res pay respect to the tribal elders and the people of this community, some of whom are here tonight, who uh, serve and continue to serve as stewards of the land and waterways in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. We recognize the unique and enduring relationship that exists between indigenous people and their traditional territories. And we acknowledge that we are on the ancestral homeland of the Poconoke tribe within the original territory of the Poconoke nation. Uh, let's acknowledge, let this acknowledgement serve as a reminder of our ongoing efforts to recognize, honor, reconcile, and partner with the Poconoke people whose lands and waters we benefit from today. And now let me introduce 
of of Fomenku Su Mikenak. I don't say it often enough. <laughs> and uh, after butchering his name, uh, you also go by Strong Turtle, right? That's correct. <laughs> right. That's easier. <laughs> um, but uh, he's the historian for the Poconoka tribe and the living descendant of the Massasoit uh, Medicom, whose father, the Massasoit Usamequin, is central in the, uh, to the subject of tonight's conversation. So, uh, we'll give you the stage and uh, give you the stage. and then perhaps we can hand to Don and then we'll have some informal conversation. I know Dave and I have some questions. So it's going to be a really informal affair. You just heard me tell our two speakers. I'll, I'll project my up for the back. Um, I think what we're going to do is hear a little bit kind of off the top of their head from Richard and then also from Don about this particular moment in the 17th century. And then we're going to open it up for questions. I know I have many, and I know Dave does too, but we would really love this to be an interactive event. I know we've all been to many history events where someone lectures at you for, you know, an hour. We really want this to be, you know, more of a conversation as we learn about this piece. So I'd love to hear, you know, some opening remarks perhaps from both of our speakers, and then we can kind of branch into questions depending on what each of those say. Perfect. All right. Well, I'll hand over to our, our two speakers. Richard, I don't know, did you want to go first? Would you, like to... uh, you know, I have no problem. There's plenty of time for both of us. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if you feel comfortable, I can set a bit of the background and we can just go forward from there. Yes. Now, this meeting, we're talking about 400 years. This is the second time Winslow has gone to see the Massasoit. And this is Massasoit Old Smeekman. We're talking. 1623. To understand the importance of this context, we have to come back a few years. We know that the separatists arrived in Patuxent, what would become Plymouth Colony, around 1620. But before that, we have the Great Dying, where diseases from Eurasia were traded with our people and unbeknownst to them, they had no natural immunities. And the majority of our people died, including the first family of Massasoit Osamequin. So many people don't understand when we talk about later the King Philip's War and his children, we talk about Wam Sutter or Paul Medicament, that wasn't his first family. And so we're looking at a society that's going through a tremendous crisis. And many of us can, in some ways, in context, relate because we have also lived through a pandemic and we can see what that can do to governments and institutions and faith and leaders. And so this was a society that was shaken. And this individual somehow, even though, according to Daniel Gookin, who would report that the Poconoke people here at Soames used to be able to put to field 3,000 warriors, he was only able to greet these separatists with a retroin around 300 men. And most of those 300 weren't there. They were guarding the women and children back at home. <clears throat> and so, we have Massasoit Osamiqui, who must have been a master diplomat. And at the same time, he's feeling pressure from his enemies, his rivals to the west of Narragansett, and the plague hasn't reached them yet. And they take full advantage and they press him for his territory that's in Rhode Island. And so he's on the run. And so that's one idea. Uh, we have a people who have known defeat, who have tasted bitterness, who are now in a state of embarrassing impoverishment. And here come these newcomers, and these weren't the first Europeans to arrive, by the way. Whether you look at the uh, navigation and charts of Verrazano, who came uh, almost a century before, an explorer who was hired by <clears throat> the French Margia at the time, or we talk about uh, Thomas Dermer in 1619, we were familiar with these outsiders to the point where um, when Plymouth Colony came up, we had Tisquantum come up and say, Welcome, Englishmen. And I, if I was an English colonist, I would have had a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the context that we're going into, that you have two societies from two different worlds that are extremely vulnerable, and in some extent, see how they may mutually benefit from working together. I have no doubt that if the Great Dying has never happened, and you have to understand, the English settlers came on land that was cleared and used to agriculture. They did not have to chop down forests. 
the fields were already there. It was built on top of the ruins of the civilization that existed beforehand. It was a populated area, and had the Great Dying not happened, there would be no room for Plymouth Colony, and they got a taste of that when they met the Nossets up in um, West Ham in Massachusetts right now, because the Nossets originally attacked them. And this is just in 1620, and so Massasoit Osamequin arrives, and the Poconokets were ahead of a confederation. We talk about songs, and songs today includes Barons in Bristol Warren, <clears throat> the East Bay in Massachusetts up to Rehoboth, Rehobo, Seacock, Swansea, Fall River, but that was just Somes. That was the domain of the Poconoke people. Massasoit Osamequin's authority stretched way beyond that, down from the Cape all the way up to um, our people have three sacred mountains. We have Mount Patumtuck, which is here in Bristol, Rhode Island, Mount Wachusetts, all the way up in Massachusetts, and Mount Monagnock in New Hampshire. And our people and our reach stretched all the way up from there up towards um, west of the Hudson River in, in New York. And that was our influence. And so when Massasoit Osamequin made that original peace treaty going in 1621, and later <clears throat> he secured the survival for that vulnerable um, few years of Plymouth Colony. And it was supposed to be a mutual agreement. And we can see this later because in 1621 in September, there was a follow-up treaty of the surrounding sachems in the area the Treaty of Amenity or um, Submission, where you have individuals like Corbettin, who was the Sachem of what's now in Picasso and Fall River. You have Quana Quinna, and all the leaders of renown in the area, Osamequin told them to sign it. There's about nine of them in general. And if you go to their names and see the areas that they controlled, those were the areas that surrounded Plymouth Colony. And they were only there because Master Soy Osamequin told them to, to be there. Now, it was in... Um, the goodwill that the first meeting in 1621, and you know what, Edward Winslow was there as well, decided that it's a good idea that we go down to this place of Poconoke and Solms and meet this master soil and do a little reconnaissance and uh, some diplomacy to see where we are. And history takes place <clears throat> and steps, and even if you go through the reading, you can see that they are known evidence that. We didn't even have enough people to bury the dead. There were bones on the path, on the pathways, laid out. Their whole visit there, you can see evidence of the great dying. And in 1621, Massasoit Osamequin had to figure out a way without using the traditional um, <coughs> tool of governments, which is coercion, force, to keep his people, his confederacy together. Because not all his people wanted the separatists to be there. Even Corbettin, from the, <clears throat> who is now Picasso in Fall River, was very clear. And this may have happened hundreds of years ago, but people have a knack for reading body language. And the English colonists could look at Corbettin and they could tell that despite what Master Soy Osamequin said, he did not like them. And in fact, he would later send to the colonists on his own accord, accord some arrows wrapped in a rattleskin as a threat. And uh, I think it was, and the colonists replied back by sending in a, a pouch of rattle skin, some powder, and a few musket balls in response. <laughs> and uh, Corbettin, though, was still conspiring to undermine what Master Soy Osamequin was doing. And he was a little rebellious. And had it not been for the good fortune and loyalty of Pinesi warriors that Osamequin had, like Habermach, his scheme would have been, would not, may not have been discovered. And this is important, but Massasoit Osamequin was a forgiven man. And he realized that he needed allies, and most of these people were relations to him. Corbinan's daughters would later marry his sons. Wiedemo, Witam, Wuski would marry Philip, or Medicom, and Wiedemo, I mean, in Wamsutta. So most of these <coughs> people that he would have to deal with were his relations. And he forgave Corbinan for trying to rise against him. And this is in 1621 alone. 1622, when in Plymouth Colony, there were two people who were to be the eyes and ears for the English. There was Habermach, a Pinesi warrior, a Massasoit's man, and then there was Tisquantum. And in 1622, Tisquantum was doing a lot of double dealing. And Massasoit found out about this, and according to the original treaty, the idea that these two people 
you would handle the law. If an Englishman broke the law, he would go to the English and receive justice. But if a person under Massasoit, one of his people broke the law, he would go to Massasoit Osamequin and receive justice. That didn't happen. So in 1621, everyone knew that this treaty was broken because the colonists, Plymouth Colony, decided not to hand over to Squantum. And it's one of those what ifs in history because the tensions were escalated, but he died and the situation went away. And then a year later, in 1623, there's word comes to Plymouth Colony that the Massasoit is sick. And usually, this wouldn't be much of concern. The Massasoit wasn't an old man at this time. Everyone gets a cold once in a while. But remember, less than five years, most of the people you've known have died. No one knows the nature of this sickness. And this may be the last time you see him. And so, when we hear about this, we want to ensure that we're on good terms with this man who might be on his deathbed. So, <clears throat> Edward Winslow, with a party, goes back to Poconoke, goes back to Soames to see the Massasoit. And on his way there, he has to cross, uh, he crosses paths with Corbazan again, who's smiling. And I can't believe that it didn't go through Winslow's mind that if something happens to Massasoit Osamequin, this person might have influence in the area and how very different the relationship would be. And Habermock is there and he starts weeping because people are coming back from all over because when you hear, Massasoit is a title, it wasn't his name. It means great leader, I think a good alias would be king. And when you hear that your king is dying, people pay homage and tribute to see him one last time. And it's also a show of loyalty to be there. And it's an event that you would not miss or would want to miss, especially for those who had a diplomatic ear. So Habermock is with Edward Winslow, and he's seeing people coming down the path, and Habermock starts crying and lamenting, talking about the character of this man who would fall through this tree in 1623. How great and noble Massasoit Osamequin was, how he was not like these other Indians. He had no malice in his heart. He was kind and generous. He would govern with a f <clears throat> he would govern gently with a few strides while others would use many. That he was a loving man, slow to anger and forgiven. And that's very true considering what happened to Corbin a year before. Corbin could have ended up the way of Tisquantum if Osamequin wanted to do so, but he forgave him and brought him back into the fold, though probably a bit begrudgingly. And so this brings us to where I'm going to leave off of Richard, where this party in a very rocky couple of years, are now going to what they may see as the last time they meet their only strong supporting ally in the region for Plymouth Colony, which is still very new and fragile at this time. In thinking about today and looking at the lives of these two men, it's very significant that today we are all together because this is the 402nd anniversary of the first time they ever spoke. This is when Massasoit Usamequin feels finally that he is positioned to go to the English and be safe. That he has made certain, he has used every process to make certain his people will not be harmed. When I was a young research associate at the museum, so in my mid-twenties, I was mentored by a man I consider one of the great Wampanoag historians, Nana Pashamet. And so I had the privilege of being mentored by this man over the course of the last 10 years of his life. As a researcher, we were also responsible for answering all of the Thanksgiving questions for the press. And that first year I was having to deal with the journalists, Nani was right next to me and he was shaping my responses and he said, Richard, you need to let every historical moment live on its own. And what you are going to find is that the press is going to ask you about the event known as the first Thanksgiving and they're going to want to make an immediate jump to King Philip's War. And he said, in doing that, what gets lost is the diplomatic skill and the realpolitik of Massasoit Usamequin. He said, by immediately jumping to tragedy, 
What gets lost is just as we have heard, his mastery within the region, his ability to make relationships between indigenous communities and the English, and also to maneuver the ever-changing world of the introduction of the Dutch and the French as well as the English. And for me, this day is significant because we're going to be talking about the Sachem at a moment of utter vulnerability when for the most part they have only seen this man as a towering figure who is choosing each time he will be seen. He is making the situation early on. The first time that Edward Winslow sees the Sachem, it is Edward Winslow that is in the position of great vulnerability because his wife is dying. So when neither community will cross Town Brook to speak to the other, it's finally agreed that Tisquantum and Edward Winslow will go over to Usamequin and they will offer the welcoming remarks, offer gifts, and see if they can convince him to cross to the English with Winslow staying as hostage. And to me, it must have been an aching moment when Governor Carver goes to Edward Winslow and asks him to go across the brook. His wife will only live about 18 hours after he returns from those conversations. And think of the deaths in Plymouth. It's, it was a contagion. It was marked by a pattern. You clearly knew when death was coming. But as a reformed Christian, the approach of those within the church body was, if I ask you to do something for me and you can do it, you must do it. Unless there is extraordinary situations, you must do it. So this man crosses the brook into a situation unknown to him. At the same time, his wife is back within the settlement dying. The conversation is a good one in that it proves fruitful and the sachem crosses over into the English settlement where in the articles of peace are drafted and I think what was it like for this young man to see Massasoit Usamequin returning with his party back on the other side of Town Brook and his heart rising up and thinking I'm going to get back to Elizabeth, I'm going to get back to Elizabeth when the sachem turns to his brother, who is also a sachem, Quadaquina, and says, now you go across the brook and negotiate with these, these strangers. What is it like to have to stay those additional hours? And so if you bookend these moments of the 22nd of March, 1621, with what happens in March of 1623, these men have known one another at times of tremendous physical and emotional fragility. And what I love about the way you introduced the story was you stop at each moment and let it live on its own and how it influences the next one. Because for me in that moment, when Habamock and John Hamden and Edward Winslow are coming here to make that visit, they are terrified because they are aware they have broken that treaty. They are walking into a fractured relationship. And we do not know if after um, May of 1622, it is May when he comes to Plymouth and demands that Tisquantum be turned over to him according to the second article of the peace treaty. And it is not done. Bradford tries to calm him, distract him from that demand. Massasoit Usamequin leaves Plymouth, but again, he now sends a second demand. That is also not responded to. And then he sends men with a knife that the head and hands are to be taken and returned to him. That does not happen. Bradford says when he sees a ship in the harbor, he is wondering, is this some kind of uh, conspiracy that's going on between the French, between these men standing in front of me, and in their rage, 
Massasoit's men return here. <clears throat> we do not know whether there has been any communication between May of 1622 and what is happening in March of 1623. Habamak remains with the English. Maybe there is communication going on between him and his sachem, but we do not know. We, we cannot say with any solidity. So as those three men are getting closer and closer to Soames, they have no idea what they are walking into and how that they will be received. And think what it was like to enter the house and the powas are serving Massasoit. There are six to eight women who are rubbing his thighs, his ankles, his wrists to keep him alive and to keep him warm as the powers are at their labors. Think of the construction of the house, that to get into a house, you typically had to get very low and come up. And we are told in Winslow's account that the house is jammed. He even reports that there is one man who has come from as far away as a hundred miles to be there at the moment of death. So what is it like to not know how you will be received and then to enter a house jammed with people who are there to pay their respects, unfamiliar sounds, unfamiliar medicine, and possibly people uh, covered in ash or painted dark colors in response to the death that is coming. And we can only guess at the relationship between those two men that when he hears Winslow is present and calls for him to come over to him and offers his hand and says, Winslow, I shall never see thee again. The fact that there is enough trust between those two men that when asked to touch the body of the sachem, he is given that permission. To me, that is absolutely huge that after what has happened 10 months before, that he is given permission that he might look in the sachem's mouth, that he might administer some comfortable concerts. It was a kind of sugar and fruit confection that the sachem's jaws were clenched so tightly that the only way to get anything into his mouth was through his teeth on the point of a knife and those said it was the first thing that he had swallowed in, in two days because his tongue was so inflamed. It is one of those, how do you respond to that moment and what comes out of this, this situation of these, these two men surrounded by huge forces beyond themselves in some ways, but there is that moment between. It was, pivot, it was a pivotal moment. Because, <clears throat> as you rightly said, it wasn't just Massas the Massasoit was sick. It was a ceremony and almost a funeral at the same time that, that the way they were treating him, they were preparing his body for death. And to come there, and for Massasoit Osamequin, <coughs> it was a chance. When you think you're dying, that changes, changes perspectives. And on your deathbed, you get the idea to figure out who your real friends are and see Winslow come through. Mm -hmm. And not just to say, how are you and leave, but to stay and to try to help as best he could. And, and that it had some effects, scraping off the gunk that was on his tongue mm -hmm. and the treatment that was given started to work that he could open his mouth and after a few days he could speak. Mm -hmm. And he asked for some English pottage, mm -hmm. porridge. I call it chicken soup. There was no chicken. <laughs> Winslow sent someone to get the chicken, but it did not come in time. <clears throat> and this show of care and generosity, you know, this is happening less than a year after the break of the treaty, mm -hmm. where Owen Wright could have just gave in. And Plymouth Colony is very vulnerable at this mm -hmm. time. It's not a military encampment. There are women, children, there's a handful of men there who have arms, but 17th, 17th century gunpowder weapons were not enough placed against hundreds of warriors. Mm -hmm. And Plymouth Colony truly could have went the way of Roanoke. 
with the stroke of a word. And when Matsuo Osumikun sees him here, and Winslow stays until he's back to health, he says, Winslow, now I know you are my true friend. And swears, and his word was his bond, that I will never harm you or raise harm against you. Not just him, but the network and power he controlled his own people, because we have to remember, his own people didn't agree with him. Some of his most powerful sachems were saying or were against his treaty and his idea that you should let these newcomers stay and settle on our land. Mm -hmm. And being the leader he was, he went then. He had so much res he commanded so much respect, even in this weakened state, that these sachems still followed him. They might have grumbled about it, but they still followed him. And when he said, Winslow, you are my friend, that is a pivotal moment because now he sees Plymouth Colony as coming into the fold and it would create a bond. Almost a near, we talk about near-death experiences, that is one of them. And Osamika would see them as a friend and, oh, by the way, I want to tell you something, friends, now that we are friends. And he brings in Habermas and a few of his trusted Pymesian counselors and he reveals to them that some of those people, we talk about again, 1621, the treaty <clears throat> where nine of the most powerful sachems in the area had to sign a treaty promising their peace in English. Many of these people and some of the tribes and sachems from the Massachusetts were planning an attack. And given what happened with Tisquantum, Massasoit Osamegan wasn't about to fight his own people for Plymouth Colony. He was going to let it happen. Be what it may. But now I know the English are my friends. They care about me. And if they're my friends, how could I not let them know what is happening in this event, which is so undertaken. Sometimes we look at history, we're plagued with hindsight. We look at the end because we know what's going to happen. And we forget about all the different rivers and courses it could have taken and one decision didn't go the way it was depicted in the textbook. And by warning him about this, it sent a clear message. One, it allowed Plymouth Colony to pre prepare and preemptively strike mm -hmm. and disperse this attack before it had a chance to happen. Two, it let all the sachems know, put them back in line, where Massasoit Osamequin stood, mm -hmm. and that the English, if you are with the English or you are attacking Plymouth Colony, you are also attacking him. They are one of the same, and cemented an alliance that talks about generation. We're talking about peace. Peace is not just a word, it's a relationship. <coughs> And really, that action by coming there cemented a relationship that would last till his death in 1660, 1661. Massasoit Osamequin would never raise a hand in violence against Plymouth Colony as long as he lived, even as issues of land and demographic shifts and population encroachment became stronger and the next generation did not understand the times of the vulnerability of what it was like to be there in 1620 and they forgot the kindness that was shown to them. He held his peace and he maintained it because he saw Winslow as his friend. Mm -hmm. And he was trusted even after the death of Winslow when he sent messengers to Plymouth Colony to announce his death. No one suspected foul play. Now that was a different sachem from the area. If that was perhaps Canonicus, though he was gone by this time, or from a different tribe, there might have been some suspicion but Osamequin not only trusted the English and that the English seemed to have trusted him in this bond, that there was a relationship, there was a pact. And as you talk about the idea of trust, it was building, in 1622 it was shaken, but it was really solidified with this act of kindness. And we forget how far kindness can go. Peace is something you have to work on. It's a generational thing, and it's so unfortunate that their sons, not just Osamequin's son, but Winslow's sons, tended to forget about this and, it, and relations eroded in the 1650s and 60s going into the King Philip's War. But what if Winslow was too scared, I wonder, and he just walked away or didn't say anything, didn't try to help and didn't try to stay with this man who he did not know in a world that he did not know. And it really is something that you have to wonder just how vulnerable Plymouth Colony was at this time. It had Winslow acted differently, we would have a 
the history of the United States would have changed. It <coughs> was the brush of the pen. <coughs> In, in getting ready for tonight, I started charting what were the moments when they saw one another, whether here, whether in Plymouth, because when the sachem asks Winslow for a pottage, he describes it as one that he had when he was at Plymouth. So there are all of these undocumented encounters that are happening. And I think we need to reimagine the degree to which these li people are living face to face. That, thank heavens, the archaeology that's being done by UMass Boston is changing the way we imagine the relationship. Because, so tomorrow morning, March 23rd, uh, 1621, the Sachem and the English exchange more gifts. And in the course of conversation with John Carver, the governor, he says, our, our wives and our women are in the woods nearby, but we'll be back in eight or nine days to set corn on the other side of the brook. And no one believed that actually happened. But the archaeology is showing that it did indeed happen. And so that is beginning to fold in a greater presence of Poconoke women in that first year because we need to reimagine the way Tisquantum was teaching them corn, beans, and squash. That it, he may have been serving as a translator when they're actually watching the process of the women on the other side of Town Brook. Because think of the vulnerability of the English. They had never seen this grain before. And so they are having to depend completely on native teachers. They would not have known when it was ripe. They would have not known how to harvest it. They would not have known how to process it. And that is more than one moment of Tisquantum saying, you do this, you do this, you do this. And so we need to be reimagining the landscape, that moment when the sachems or their ambassadors are at Plymouth on September 13, 1621. That's another moment for Winslow and Massasoit Usumiquin to be together. And then only a few weeks later, presumably in late September, early October, that's when the harvest feast that we traditionally call the first Thanksgiving occurred. And he is there with, at a minimum, 90 men. But Winslow, in the letter describing these three days, he says, comma, amongst others, comma. So is he also exercising that influence in bringing other sachemships with him to Plymouth? And so now the human landscape is radically different than the one we've traditionally imagined. It's 52 English men, women, and children, half of whom are under the age of 16. And at a minimum, 90 native men, but now probably also all of those households that the sachem has sent to be on the other side of Town Brook for that year as well. It's a very different imagining. So they may be face to face more than we can conceive. And I think for me, this conversation is opening questions about how frequently were they seeing one another? And is, is there a way of recapturing uh, what was there beyond these two very famous encounters? What is happening in between? That's certainly true. And after this visit, we're starting to see this trust develop where there was actually a trading house that was allowed to come on the border of Solms. And this is very significant because the significance that Solms was the sea of the Massasoit. Now later on in his life, Old Samiquin would be with his wife, well his, not his second wife, it was a uh, polygamy, did exist, but his um, Anna Warnhart's daughter, that's the Quaybald Mintmonks, he would marry her and that's where Philip and the rest would come from and he spent his later years up there, near Brookfield. But during this time to allow the English to have an outpost so close meant, as you say, there's a lot we don't capture in official documents that there was daily interaction <coughs> and that even friendships 
and that later in the 1640s and 50s where Osmika's children were raised, they would have this bond with some of the individuals and all too often we, when we look at conflict, we think of the idea that people have the same ideas as their leaders and that's not the case. Mm -hmm. And even before um, 1675, before the war started, um, Metacom and Warren the Brown family who lived close by and that, that just shows the development of the nature of trust that it opened a doorway for there to be casual relationships, conversations, games, children interacting with each other. Mm -hmm. And when we look at the documents and sources, we don't capture that in the treaties, but we have to think about what it implies and what trust looks like. Trust isn't just, I leave you alone and you leave me alone. It means that I help each other and I trust you with my life. I'm not worried, I do not see you as an enemy. And if I don't see you as an enemy, that means that changes the nature of how we relate to each other. And we look at the landscape of um, what was happening in southern New England at the time. It was a completely different world. And Winslow and the Sicilian colonists had to be aware of the politics of the landscape. We can't be fooled by hindsight and just assume that they're going to have the hegemon of the region. That wasn't known to this generation right now. So when two people see each other and this idea of um, almost reminds me of um, the 14 points when we talk about uh, Woodrow Wilson centuries later, the idea that there has to be a degree about peace among equals and how they saw each other <coughs> not as rivals but in a way that they can coordinate and live together. Mass mm -hmm. Soil when could not have the foresight to understand that this was part of a greater migration from England. But there was a belief that in his heart and in his mind, there was a place for Plymouth Colony within his domain. Mm -hmm. And that they would be one, he can use them as, in some ways, a buffer against his rivals, but it would be a mutually beneficial relationship. Mm -hmm. And we can only go off this attitude that happened in the 1620s and moving on into on the 1630s where Master Soils so can get some of his strength back. And he goes and has a brief war against the Narragansetts, very brief. But it's interesting because the colonists, when we talk about this idea of um, trust, there was a push for uh, the colonists in uh, Plymouth to assure and write that Massasoit Osmequin was given his liberties and rights granted to him, and that anything that was taken from the Narragansett, at least in paper, would be restored to him. So we're seeing the legacy of that trust building on that they at least wanted Osamequin to have what he had prior to the um, incursions from his rivals and whether or not that was a from genuine benevolence and if it was from Edward Winslow, I believe it was. Maybe some of the other colonists thought that if Massasoit Osamequin controls the land it would be easier to have a treaty and then get ownership of said land. But either way, there's a lot in between the lines of these trees that we sometimes overlook. And there are, one of the, the great sadnesses is that there are events that we can't possibly <coughs> recapture. Uh, William Bradford never wrote about his wives. He didn't write about his first wife who fell from Mayflower. He did not write about his second wife until his will, when it's clear how much he loved her and wanted to protect her. His marriage is a larger event in many ways than the Harvest Feast of 1621. So in March of 1623, there is the visit that Winslow pays to him. There is the shift in geopolitics in the region based on what happens at Wessagusset. And on August 14th, 1623, William Bradford marries for the second time to Alice Carpenter Southworth, a widow who comes. They have known each other from the church in Holland, and they are married. And Massasoit Usamequin is there with one of his wives and 120 men, and we are told with other kings as well. And the only reason we know of the event in any detail is there was a young man who had just arrived from England three weeks before and was writing about it to his older brother. So he tells us that the sachem gave to Governor Bradford in 
time before the ceremony itself, he presented four or five bucks and a turkey. So Emmanuel Altham, in writing the letter to his older brother, said, and we had venison pasties, and the natives danced, and we gave gifts of a hat and a coat and a feather uh, to the sachem. So there are events that we just, at this moment, based on the documentation that we have, there may be things that happen that we just don't know about. Um, and our knowledge is all based on the rarest of survivals and things being found. Uh, Charlotte knows one of my favorite stories that the second ship that came to Plymouth in November of 1621 is only there for a month. And as I was thinking about today, that may be another moment when Winslow is here with Robert Cushman, the colony's business agent, because Cushman writes about meeting Usamequin. But again, until the archaeology, that first pamphlet describing the English year in the homeland was always looked at with a kind of suspect, is this just propaganda? But the archaeology is showing us that these reports of community and company are indeed true. So Winslow may also have been here between second week of November and second week of December 1621. It's just not certain. There is a manuscript that is entrusted to Robert Cushman, the business agent, to take back into England to be printed. And the ship is captured by French pirates in the English Channel. And he is taken to an island no bigger than Martha's Vineyard that is known for piracy because it's shaped like a capital G. So the, the seized ships could be brought inside the island and hidden. The Marquis of this tiny island ordered that all of the correspondence, anything written, be brought to him and read to him. And he found the manuscript describing the first year so delightful, he would not give it back. So it, it just happened. This is, this is my very odd life. It just <laughs> happens. I was asked to go to the United Nations and tell people about Thanksgiving. They wanted me to walk out as a pilgrim and explain Thanksgiving. And I said, you can't do that. I said, so what if I start as Richard Pickering and a pilgrim shirt goes all the way down below your ankles. You see more of me at the beach. I can change into the character right in front of the audience and when my hat goes on, George Soule is there. I live almost at the tip of Cape Cod, so after I had done this at the United Nations, here I am in the basement of the Wellfleet Congregational Church doing the same thing. Mother and Daddy take me out to dinner afterwards, and we're at the Oyster House, and a couple walks over to the table and says, I was just at your talk. It was a lovely little talk. Uh, can I tell you something? And I said, yes, sir. He said, I'm from the island. <laughs> so in all the nights in all the world, there's this man from the island who now makes it his obsession to try to find this manuscript. So he searched for years and they came to the conclusion that if it has survived, it's in Paris. But how was it cataloged when Napoleon centralized all archives in the city? So it could be that what we are talking about tonight could be utterly transformed if that can be recovered. And so in the same way that finding Philip's belt, finding Philip's flags in England, and having them return to you, the finding of that manuscript could change the very way we imagine what happened within that first year and tell us events we can't even conceive of based on the pamphlet that Cushman tried to pull together from what he was allowed to retain. So when I talk to students, I always say, what I'm telling you right now, I might need to throw out the window in a little while because things could change. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And <clears throat> A big part of history is trying to get to the whole story, and sometimes we only have snapshots or fragments, and trying to 
really look at what we're trying to see. And that's why we can't just ignore the oral history of the people who were here. And the Poconoke people are people that have been hiding in plain sight. And it's very hard when you talk about the indigenous heritage here because we were removed from the land. And when people ask about, well, if we want to get someone's perspective, well, why can't we ask? It's because our people were forced off here. We really want to talk about what Soam says, Bristol, Rehoboth, Swansea. You know, the real estate right now is four or $500,000. Our people can't afford to live here if they decide to move back. And we talk about generations of having your language removed from us. Our people were sold into chattel slavery, especially the men after the war. And they were sold as far as way as the um, Azores into um, Bermuda, <clears throat> the Cayman Islands, Barbados. And there was even a law there because Bradford had a connection <coughs> with the English uh, sugar or English spice plantations in the Caribbean. And to help pay off the war debt for the war, many of our men were sold there. And there was actually a law in Hackney saying that no more Poconoke men or captives from the war were allowed to come to the island. And then we have our women and children who were marked as indentured servants and they were put in English households and told to uh, that their history was wrong and that they must assimilate, but assimilate in a manner where they are still subservient to the society they must become a part of, which is this hard. And it also would mean that because they are vulnerable, economic mobility was not essential, so you would have to move from place to place. The remnants of Massasoit's Osamequin family, uh, the captains, would be sent to the Shintucky Reservation, which is now in Connecticut. And that's where impressive my family stayed for nearly a century. So when we talk about this idea of capturing what happens, yes, those lost documents are important, but also the oral history of the descendants of the people that are here, not just um, the Polk Nogu, we talk about the Massachusetts and all the other tribes in southern New England that have been marginalized and high in plain sights, but still know who they are because colonization has two parts. There's a the physical aspect, but there's also the psychological aspect and the resistance from fathers and mothers to let their children know who they are and their name and still remember and pass it on. That's a wealth of knowledge that has not really been tapped into. And as we get into this idea of figuring out the history, we know the big players. We know about Massasoit, Osamequin. We know about Canonicus. We know about Corbin. But what about these small stationships? What are their stories? What happened after 1675? How do these families, and that's what you have to follow, you have to follow about families and, my, and how they migrated from town to town because you weren't allowed to stay in your ancestral homeland. We have to have those stories taken into account too. And once we hear those stories, how much broader the connection can be and how we can connect those stories to the historical documents that we have and the ones that are missing that we're still looking for. And how our eyes can be opened even more to really the transformative nature, how quickly things can change in a year, in five years, in <clears throat> ten years. And when we look back at that treaty in 1623, if you would reverse it and just add a couple more decades in 1643, the world was upside down. It was now the English or Plymouth Colony, Massachusetts Bay Colony, that were in a very strong position. And it was the Poconoke and many of the other um, people of southern New England that were now in a very weak position. And the idea it brings up the theme of vulnerability. And when the tables are turned and it's vulnerability, what happens to that trust that was so solidified between Osamequin and Winslow all those years ago? And just leaves you to ponder that question about what else do we know, what stories do we not ask? Because history is always his story. And we have to think about the person who's not in the room and that perspective of that voice that was silenced. And bring that in perspective if we truly want to understand and take into account what really happened and the transformative nature of such actions. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? I think it fits perfectly with this amazing dialogue that we've been all privileged to hear this evening. Um, I really love the perspectives that you're both bringing and I think particularly what you're talking about right now, this idea of working with the sources that we have, right? Like scholars such as Dan Richter have called for us to face East from Indian country to imagine the perspective that's missing from the written sources. Um, we're seeing really um, exciting work by various other indigenous groups, um, 
An example that comes to mind is the Tomaquot edition of Roger Williams, A Key into the Language of America, that we see Narragansett scholars basically going through a 17th century English source and footnoting and telling us their perspective historically and contemporarily. And this is amidst the time where we're seeing bigger calls for actual decolonization, not a metaphor, right? Returning the land, cultural revitalization, language reclamation projects. So I'd love to hear like both of you perhaps speak a little bit about the particular source that we're interested in tonight, which is good news, right? So, you know, imagine, and I've got two questions. My first one is for you, Don. If we could kind of go through perhaps this particular moment in, in good news and footnote it from a Poconokit's perspective, what, what might that look like? What things would we be saying in that text? And then for Richard, perhaps for those people who don't know the primary source very well, can you give us a bit more context about like where and when it's published, how it's published, the different editions, you know, the ones that survive, and, and give us a bit more context there. Yeah. Um, absolutely. When we look at uh, good news from a Poconoke perspective, it's, it's a sad story, really. You know, um, <clears throat> we're talking about the idea of a society deal more in mourning. We cannot phantom today a world where 10, 20, let alone 90% of the people you know have disappeared in less than five years. And waves of this pandemic will come back again. It did not go away. It wasn't just a one thing and done. And then to see your leader, your leader now at his most vulnerable, it was truly a terrifying thing. You don't know what's going to happen. You know, you have, and then it's the politics behind it. You have the other sachems thinking behind the things when Osamequin's gone, what are we going to do? You know, we can't specify where uh, his children, uh, his daughters, and um, his sons, such as Wam Sutter and Metacama, were born. They were probably born a bit later. If Wam Sutter was around, he was a child, and transitions of powers to children never work in systems like this. So we have to think about the fear the idea of a possible civil war, a power struggle that was going to happen and camps you're going to go in, and then you have these strangers just show up. And all of a sudden, they stay long enough, and you don't know if they really healed them or not, but they stay long enough for your leader to get better. And now he says that we are his friends, and the great Massasoit is now taking account of the people who didn't come and visit him. And you're starting to wonder, <laughs> am I on his good side or not? So that's part of that perspective when we talk about good news. And it was very, it was a nail-biting situation for the Poconoke people. And really, if you think from perspective, what is going to happen? This is just an internal situation. There's still conflict to the West with the Narragansetts happening. We have um, the Pequots of the Uncas starting to make incursions into the area. So it's really a time where the world seems uncertain. The world is turned upside down because that generation that grew up didn't know this. When we talk about when Benjamin Church arrested um, Anawan at the end of King Philip's war and takes him into captivity, Anawan will say to him and boast about how what it was like, a world we will never truly know. The closest thing we could have is our wampum belt, which was part of the royal regalia. All right, it wasn't just one belt, <clears throat> but there was one particular belt that was so large that you actually have to hold it on your shoulder and would drip down to your feet. And every generation would add on to this wampum belt. And it wasn't just designs, it was a narration of our history. And our people would read it back and forth, talk about our victories our defeats, where we came from, and from the renown, from all of our leaders, all our Massasoits. And as Anawan Handy, who was the head Pioneer warrior, handed these royalties over, Anwan was an old man at this time. He lived long enough to see a time where his people were at, I can't say the apex, because we don't know, and listen to the fear and the whisper that was happening in the communities, it would have been, at the very least, stressful and disconcerting. And that is my take on how the Poconokets would have seen good news and what a <laughs> Or a worst nightmare would be probably our rendition of it, of what was happening. 
but that's just part of our perspective of what was happening in our society and how the world was turning upside down. <clears throat> you have access. Charlotte knows I always love to try to go back to the very first edition to try to keep people from getting between me and the original creator. And Edward Winslow is interesting because he was a printer that he goes to Holland to join the church that Reverend John Robinson is leading and while there he's working as a printer for William Brewster, the ruling elder of the church, who is printing books that are illegal in England because of their religious content. So those are being smuggled out of Holland in wine barrels <coughs> that have false bottoms, where the top is wine and the bottom is the smuggled books that are being sent into Scotland and that are being sent south and distributed illegally. Winslow loved a beautiful book. He loved his craft. And so when Robert Cushman prints the first pamphlet in February of 1621, and it's this hodgepodge mess of what he was allowed to retain by the Marquis, one of the things that Cushman does to flesh out the fall of 1621 story is he publishes a private letter Winslow wrote to a friend. And Winslow was horrified because what he said of the Poconokan was wrong. That was meant to be between two friends. He was new in their country, and so his impressions were wrong. His impressions weren't informed, and he was horrified that they got into print without his permission. So good news is written by Edward Winslow and taken back into England in September of 1623 when he returns on the Anne or the Little James and he oversees its publication. So what you will see if you, if you go to archive.org, archive.org and sort on good news from New England, it will take you to a digital image of the first edition from 1624 that's held by the Boston Public Library. It is the closest way of getting to what Edward Winslow originally intended, original punctuation, paragraphing, spelling. And the interesting thing about this particular copy, it was owned by Reverend Thomas Prince. And Thomas Prince created the Library of New England that was in the steeple of the Old South Meeting House. That was where Bradford's manuscript was when it was stolen by the English and taken back to London. Reverend Prince did a detailed chronology of New England's history uh, up until um, about 1640. So you have all of Reverend Thomas Prince's notes in it, but then that was purchased by President John Adams so you also have President Adams' notes throughout this particular edition as well. What you have on the table before you, um, Dave printed out chapter four from Good News, um, describing what we've been talking about, but there is no such thing as chapter four. In the original edition, it's one continuous story. One event flows into the other. And the only isolated essay is a series of conversations that he's had with the Panese with Sachems about matters of spirituality and he is trying to correct the errors that he wrote in his private letter to George Morton. Mm -hmm. So what you see, it's um, Convitant, the on the return from Soames of John Hamden, Edward Winslow, and Habermach, they spend the night with Convitant who, in the summer of 1621, they had attacked his household, thinking that he had harmed Disquantum and that he had conspired with the Narragansett to thrust Massasoit Usamequin out of his territories. Winslow is terrified that he is going to be the rising sachem upon the death of Massasoit Usamequin, but on the return to Plymouth after the sachem's health is assured, 
and the sachem holds back Habamak to share news of what's happening at Wessagusset, Edward Winslow and John Hamden spend the night with Kamatan and his household. And we have record of part of the dialogue back and forth. And over the course of dining, Edward Winslow explains how grace is given before meat and after meat. And Conbatant is now asking questions where he's looking at Winslow as a subject of, oh, I need to search you and figure out what you're all about. And it moves on to a discussion of the Ten Commandments. And what Edward Winslow reports is, um, we could close on everything but the Seventh Commandment about thou shalt com not commit adultery. That that brought them a lot of <laughs> laughter. And Winslow said, you know, Conbatant was very funny, loved to make jokes, but also found jokes made back to him that were equally as pungent. He would roar. And so, again, it's that transformation of relationships that's completely unexpected when you go from men who were terrified of one another, feeling there was animus in the other, and during the conversation, at one point, Conbatant looks at Winslow and says, well, if if I was sick and I sent word to Plymouth, would you, would you come? And Edward Winslow said yes, and that was probably the question was as unexpected as the response was. But again, you can't see what's coming. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I can put this cleanly or clearly. Since so much of our history is his story and not her story, mm -hmm. and then on top of that, it's the white man's version of what happened versus what may have happened. As an indigenous historian, I'm always curious, how do you how do you get the right stuff? How do you get the right information? How are you able to balance what you're reading in treaties that were primarily written by the white man, along with so much of your history was oral history up until a certain point, and then it becomes put in, in writing. So I'm curious how you're able to, I, to me, I think you have a harder job than we do as white historians because you have to sift through so much of written through the eyes of someone else. How do you go about sifting through the information to feel that you, you're getting more accurate, if that makes any sense? You know, um, as a uh, teacher of history, when I talk to my students, you know, bias can be applied to anyone. It's the real truth for any historian to really look at a source critically. And that's why it's always best to look at multiple perspectives and see what patterns you see to get a holistic thing. Because everyone has a different account. You know, um, when we talk about um, <clears throat> when we talk about looking at different accounts, and here's the thing about the Pocahontas story that makes it so intriguing is that our oral history matches, or there's a pattern with the written account. And so you see that you're looking for um, that continuity. And you also want to look at the time of the sourcing because bias and hubris affects everyone. And when you start reading from the accounts of, you know, a new generation of historians in the 1800s and the Manifest Destiny and um, this idea of romanticizing indigenous people, and then you look at historians in the 20th century going off what the 18th century historians see, you see that dissonance. But when you get to a primary source and you want to look in context, one thing that stands of note is that the people who were there, yes they had biases, but they also wanted to survive. And so in some ways their accounts or parts of their accounts are accurate because they could not afford to elaborate on things because mi mixing up whose sachem this was, whose territory this, that was, was a life or death decision. There was no guarantee in 1620, 1621, 22, 23, 24, that you would live to see tomorrow. And when you wrote these documents down, you were writing something, not just to give a fluffy account of the world, but you were writing something down that would be useful, that would be pivotal to your survival so that other colonists could come and navigate this place correctly and they wouldn't end up dead. So that's one thing you have to take into the author of the source and really what happens because after 1675, where you start to see that the hegemony of Plymouth Colony, Massachusetts Colony, and New England as a whole start to see as a riot, you start to see this heavy bias against indigenous people. And you know, that's part of unfortunate that's an unfortunate side of human nature because it wasn't to extend a religious settlement. So there wasn't an interest 
and indigenous culture, indigenous history. We have to understand that when we look at New England today, the entire environment has been changed. Even the trees that we see here, they're like third, fourth generation trees. If you went to colonial New England during the time of the American Revolution, all this land would have been cleared. There was no regard for uh, artifacts, indigenous culture, which is why my, you know, I salute and put my hat up to any historian or archaeologist that tries to find a remnant of something because so much was disregarded and just destroyed or considered rubbish and burnt. <clears throat> you know, burial mounds were cleared for land. <clears throat> settlements, again, we have to understand that the first colonists, the first settlements were built on top of existing settlements. Those bones, the wampum, was all considered not valuable and destroyed. There was no photos, there was no art taken, there was no images of what the indigenous people looked like or how they dressed. We have to go by the writing and because of that religious narrative, those little things don't always come into account. Like uh, we could talk about the first visit that Winslow made to Massasoit Olsamequin and how he entertained them. And it would have been a historian's best dream to be there and see what the games were and the conversations and the types of food. But Winslow doesn't write about that that much. He, he'll say, there was dancing, there were some games. It doesn't tell us what kind of game it was, it doesn't tell us who won, and we went home. <laughs> because that wasn't a priority based on, upon his needs and the society he came from. Now, on the indigenous perspective, there's something else you need to take and consider about the different voices and how um, history can fragment or distort stories over time and figure out whose voice you're listening to. Because of the nature of Pocanoke or who we are, it wasn't really popular to openly say you're indigenous in America. Going up to the 1970s, I forget, there was, um, there was an American actress in the 1970s who was a supporter of indigenous rights, and she came up during a Grammy Award. Her name eludes me. Oh, yes. And she was booed and jeered. They had to get security to hold some of the individuals down. This is the 1970s. And so we have to understand the mass cultural shame in suppressing indigenous knowledge and every elder we, we lose is history. That's, we have living libraries and every elder, every generation that did not take up the mantle as I have done or other people, other indigenous individuals, whether it's the Narragansetts or the Pequots who have listened to the stories of the elders, that history is lost and all you have is someone saying, I know I'm indigenous but I don't know anything else. And that's what's so important about this oral history and our tradition of keeping it alive and passing it on to the next generation. Because when um, people become disheartened, when they realize, you know, when they just give in and say, I'm just going to assimilate, I'm just going to get a job, I don't want to talk about any of this, my mother and my father didn't talk about it, they were ashamed, it didn't do them any good, why should I care? That's how we lose our libraries and our sources only to have people backtrack into the family Bibles and try to figure out who this great uncle was or who this cousin was and try to put that story back together. So from that perspective as an indigenous historian, one challenge is getting the actual story. Because not everyone, what was once common knowledge, that knowledge isn't always passed over to the next generation. Sometimes you get fragments of it. And then you have to backtrack to try to recover what should be your own birthright and then, because of the disparity in the United States government today, which is ironic since the institution that spent the first half of its um, lifetime trying to destroy indigenous people is now one of the de facto authorities and saying who is and who isn't a, um, indigenous, makes, is trying to um, pressure indigenous people to come up with this oral history as if they have a, a printout in their back pocket. And it sets everyone off, because that's like me going down the street and asking you to give your entire lineage of whatever country you came from, whether it be Europe or East Asia or um, Africa or South and Central America, in detail, generation for generation. I mean, Ancestry.com makes a business out of this, but we expect it of indigenous people who had to suppress their heritage and knowledge to survive. Again, we keep talking about King Philip's War, but we don't understand how people survived after that. That's hundreds of years. And the stories that are told are sometimes lost or marginalized, so when we talk about indigenous history, it's really not just saving the knowledge from our ancestors or our elders, but knowing how to access that knowledge. When you have, um, this is why this conversation like this is so important, where you have historians who are 
hungry for finding those different perspectives. And the challenge is where do you go or where do you look? Because it's not like you can Google on your map and there will be a hundred pings that show up and Fall River or Seekon and it allows you to go and when you go here, the indigenous perspective from this elder, from this family or this clan, it's hard to find that and for so long until recently, that family knowledge has been ignored by mainstream historians. And now we're trying to go back to it before that knowledge is lost. So it is a challenge. And not to say that bias doesn't affect indigenous people too, because if you're trying to hide who you are, sometimes that means telling a story that might not be <clears throat> and that might be fully authentic in order to ensure your kids have a better life. And sometimes you forget, and part of our idea is when we talk about indigenous people, and that's why we use the name Poconoke, because Poconoke is our name, and that's the name that the English knew us as. There were any Wampanoags here when Roger Williams, Bradford, Governor Carver came here in 1620. And that gets lost sometimes because it was a word that wasn't, we weren't allowed to say. And you would only hear it in the families of the Poconoke people. And it wasn't seen. And so when we talk about indigenous history, we have to find the stories of the elders of the people who remember those stories. And <clears throat> it is a challenge, but it's about speaking up and not forgetting who you are or having other people tell you what your history is. And that's a challenge, especially for my generation. I have hundreds of cousins, <laughs> as I'm sure many of you can recall from family reunions. But not many of them wanted to pay attention when we were little kids at family reunions to what was being said by our grandparents or some of the great-grandparents. And now, me as a man who has a family of his own, and I look around to see the elders that I looked at a little, as a little kid, when we used to go to uh, the King Phillips Inn in Bristol, a lot of them are around anymore. They're gone. Yeah. And you have to understand, and the histories they know, if you, <clears throat> we talk about in our people the past, present, and future, and we talk about moving forward with indigenous people, it also means preparing our young ones, our children, the next generation to take our place. And that's something that many indigenous communities are working towards and sometimes struggling towards, to get the next generation interested in the the culture to learn the oral history, to know who they are, because our elders won't be there forever. And when we neglect that, that's when history becomes lost. And then when that history is lost, we are left with no other choice than to for historians but to use the existing knowledge and the accounts we have. And that's the disparity that we're going through. I know I talked a lot for this question, but it deserves this much time for what we're trying to get into. both of you for sharing and I can't imagine a, a better presentation of the history and I know uh, we're looking for funds right now uh, we've applied to the Pepito fund uh, to try to uh, do some, some oral history and to capture what we can from people who are still alive who can tell these stories so uh, it, if you think history is over, forget it. <laughs> We're in the process of discovering that. I'll take uh, uh, one or two more questions, and then we really should be finishing up. Yeah. Now, Richard, you say that uh, it took a while for, to find out when, that indeed the, uh, the, uh, the bag of corn was given, and then you said that archaeology was able to tell us this. Can you tell me how archaeology did make that uh, discovery? The, so... It, that story of the, the eight or nine women are in the woods and will be back. It, our wives and women are in the woods and will be back in eight or nine days. Because they were able to actually remove mounds from the soil and then get them into the lab, they can time them down to the years. Um, for me, one of the most moving experiences I ever had was there was a point um, when no one believed the traditional story that the English learned planting maize from Tisquantum. And I thought, Tis I thought Nanapashmet was going to have a stroke. He was so angry. But it became academically fashionable to say that, and it was never clear that Tisquantum had ever been in Newfoundland, but an anthropologist said he actually learned that from English people 
planting corn in Newfoundland. Nana Pashamit was furious that a traditional story was being questioned. Fortunately, UMass Boston, a year before Nana Pashamit died, there was a horrific hurricane. And they were able to take a complete corn mound out of a farm site in Yarmouth that had been uncovered by the hurricane. And the UMass archaeologists were able to say the corn mound is 3,000 years old. And he was able to live to see a corn mound with herring bones that was 3,000 years old. So that was 1994. But the precision of timing now that an archaeologist can achieve in the laboratory is showing that, yes, indeed, if between 1620 and 25, there were Wampanoag corn mounds on the south side of Townbrook. It's amazing the way. Um, they are shifting our understanding of the face-to-face. -face. And when I came back as direct, executive, deputy executive director at the museum, I had been away for a couple of years, and what was angering me is we were beginning to use a phrase called one story, two peoples. And it was so ticking me off. So that I actually pulled the orientation film one story, two peoples, that was made by the History Channel because it was privileging one tribal nation and one English community. And I said to the staff, what I need you to do is stand on this landscape and I need you to imagine every man, woman, or child that moved across this landscape. I need you to imagine every animal that was here whether wild or domesticated, and I need you to imagine a landscape that is now radically changed by environmental change. And as you stand here on this soil, you are going to begin to see Narragansett people, Massachusetts people, French people, Dutch people, that question of who are we rendering invisible. And so that has been the challenge, and Charlotte has been part of the museum's movement to create the first interpretive plan, which we call Along These Shores of Change. And the challenge is imagining all of the networks of association and always asking, who is not sitting at our table right now? Who is that forgotten voice? And to your question, I did some charting of the English written materials. I'm, I'm working on a book and I had a research associate, a research assistant from Bridgewater State, and I said, Ashley, what I need you to do is enter this book by Edward Winslow, and I need you to find the presence of the women. And so I actually made Ashley watch part of an Alfred Hitchcock film. I said, Alfred Hitchcock wants your eyes right here, Ashley, and I need your eyes over here. <coughs> And so as soon as Ashley started reading these texts from that perspective, women began to be appearing on the periphery or central to certain events. And what was shocking to me is that it is Native women that appear more in Edward Winslow's texts than English women. And that if you chart Mort's relation, the first pamphlet, there are only three references specifically to English women, where there are 14 or 16 references to individual Native women. But it all takes doing the Alfred Hitchcock, look away from where the director wants you to looking, to what is happening in the worlds of women while these other events are happening that are being foregrounded. So it just takes entering a text from a very different way. Well. We could go on all night, couldn't we? Thank you so much. <laughs> it's been fascinating to hear both of you, and I very much uh, hope you will enjoy this. And uh, I'll be putting the video up online at the uh, SolmesHeritageArea.org website, so you can listen to it like I'm going to two or three times <laughs> to get all the nuance uh, uh, out of this presentation. But. Uh, Again, thank you so much for, for being here and sharing this wonderful history. Thanks,